Welcome to the Champions of Active Women podcast. In this podcast, we will interview women who have been successful within athletics and beyond. We hope that the amazing women in these interviews encourage and inspire girls and women to be active for a lifetime, to reach their goals, and to break new barriers in sport and life. This podcast is brought to you by the Active Women's Health Initiative in the Sports Medicine Research Institute at the University of Kentucky. The mission of the Active Women's Health Initiative is to optimize health and promote physical activity and wellness for girls and women across the lifespan. We hope you enjoy our conversations and join us in understanding women's health today to ensure women's health tomorrow. Welcome to another episode of the Champions of Active Women podcast. I'm your host, Dee Dugonski, and with me today is Dr. Sharon Brown. Dr. Brown is a professor of health and exercise science at Transylvania University, where she's been teaching for the past 24 years. Dr. Brown has been an athlete across her whole life. Her athletic career began as a member of the first Little League softball team in her town and continued at Eastern Illinois University, where she was a Division I softball athlete and named to the All-American Academic Team. Dr. Brown has never stopped being an athlete. She's run marathons, competed in triathlons, cross-country skied along the Finnish-Russian border, cycled across Switzerland and up the legendary Tour de France Mont Ventoux, and rode a mountain bike across the Continental Divide in Montana. Dr. Brown's personal passion for an active lifestyle is evident in her research on nonprofit community bike shops across the nation and her leadership of the Bike Walk Kentucky State Advocacy Group, among many other accomplishments. So Dr. Brown, thank you for joining me today via Zoom. Hi, thanks for having me. So in our emails back and forth to schedule this interview, you shared a story with me about how you came to be registered for your very first softball team. Could you share the story with our audience? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, this is an important story in my life. Um, when I was younger, girls weren't allowed to play sports. We had very little opportunity, and it was not acceptable for girls to be athletic. Um, and But I had a brother who was a year younger, and my dad was his baseball coach. And of course, I wanted to hang out with my dad and my brother, and so I started playing baseball and catch and soon enough, I was actually practicing with the team, and I actually got pretty good as a baseball player, and so I used to practice all the time, but when it came to game time, um, I had to sit on the bench. I became the scorekeeper, so all the boys got to play in the game, and I sat on the bench. Um, and I, I think over time that was obviously it was very frustrating and hard for me to understand why that would be, why it was not fair for me to play. So one year, uh, one spring, my dad went to go register my brother for uh, his little league team, and he actually registered me. I didn't know that, but he <laughs> signed me up. Um, but what happened is when he turned in my application, they tore it up. And my dad brought the pieces of the application um, that he he wrote out for me, home to me. And I put all the pieces together and I put, and we taped them together. Um, and I I know I was really upset um, about it. And my uh, it ended up that we, I wrote a letter to the local newspaper about how unfair it was that I couldn't play baseball like my brother could mm -hmm. and that there were no opportunities for girls. And that was in 19, I was in fifth grade. So that was 19, uh, 1973. And in 1972, Title IX was passed, right? Mm -hmm. um, that in, prohibited discrimination on the basis of sex in, in education and programs, right? Um, so I think the time was ripe um, and people had to pay attention to this inequity for girls um, and sports. And so our town started a little league softball team so that the girls had so that way that we weren't playing the boys league, but right. we also had a, a league of our own, which was pretty wonderful. And I have to sort of throw in this as a part of, this, uh, of my life history, but four years later, our team went to the World Series of Little League Softball. Oh, so not awesome. only did we have the opportunity, <laughs> we ended up being quite good. Um, and so it's, it's a, you know, that was in 1976. So it was a big, it was a great, it was important to me that I had great support all along the way to be active. Wait, was that softball team immediately populated with girls? Like, was there, were there a group of girls that were just ready and waiting for that kind of opportunity or was it really small at first? Yeah, great question. No, they, they, we filled all the teams. So I, awesome. I can't remember, there were six or eight teams that completely all the girls signed up for it. And That's so cool. You're very committed, yeah. Um, so for me, when I hear that story, I really think about 
the early development of your advocacy skills. And it's, it's awesome to be able to look back at your, your history and the things you're doing now and how that all kind of tells a really unique story and, and advocacy is intertwined with all of that. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just talk about kind of how those early experiences shaped your future direction for physical activity or advocacy and, and kind of your interests. Okay. Um, I, I, yeah, that's a big question. It is a big um, question. There's a lot there. So whatever part you want to tackle yeah. is fine. Yeah, I, I think I, um, what how it's sort of shaped my career is as kind of a continuation of the story that we started. Mm -hmm. So after the Little League um, World Series, when I went to high school, it was 1976. And that was four years after Title IX, but it was the first year that our girls got to play high school sports. Mm -hmm. So it, it, even four years later, it, was, it took a parent who was a lawyer um, at that high school to sue the school district to get girls to be active mm -hmm. and have sports. So I got to ride the Title IX wave all the way through. So I got to play sports in high school for four years. And then when I went to college, I was in the first, uh, my first year there was a group, was the first time the university had softball scholarships for girls. Mm -hmm. So I, I keep going back to the story partly because it shaped me so much. I had so many opportunities to be active because of Title IX and because of all the doors that were open for me in so many ways. Um, and because, you know, being an athlete, oh, there's so many benefits from being, that are important <laughs> to being an athlete. Um, I was in college really curious about how do people develop motor skills? How do you get better at motor skills? Um, I took courses um, in motor development and, and similar and also exercise physiology. I want to learn about how the body worked, um, which is why I ended up, and I, I love to learn, so teaching became a natural fit for me, and obviously mm -hmm. teaching health and exercise science um, is just a continuation of that adventure as an athlete and being physical activity, and again, all the opportunities that I had to learn and to, to grow. Um, and I think also, um, while I was in college, I was initially more interested in kind of personal health and encouraging people okay. to be physically active. Um, over time, as you can see in my, when you've uh, looked at my materials, I've mm -hmm. kind of shifted more towards the public health focus of being active. Um, and what are ways that we can uh, create communities that are healthy that increase access to being physically active for everybody, you know, for regardless mm -hmm. of economics or race or uh, gender, for all those reasons. Um, and that, that includes women, of course. And right. the Netherlands, the Netherlands um, is a really great model that I keep in mind. I actually take a group of students on a midterm travel course every other year with a colleague, and we do a point-to-point -point cycling trip where the students carry all their gear with them, but we try to live like the Dutch. Um, over 30% of people in the Netherlands bike or walk uh, to work, to school, to social activities, they live on their bikes and partly yeah. they live on the bikes because of the infrastructure that was built. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say a shout out for women, Dutch women, um, uh, a higher percentage of women ride bikes than men, um, partly because uh, women are more likely to do the grocery store shopping and take their kids to school and pick them up from school. And so their day-to-day um, commutes and adventures and, and taking their kids around are mostly done on bikes. So yeah a good way for them to be physically active. What do you think, um, kind of, do you attribute that shift from personal health to more population public health? Um, what, how, how did that happen for you? Yeah, I think I've, I've probably followed a national trend in our field in terms of sort of that shift um, to more public health focus. Um, and I think also through the, um, the longer I've been in my career, I think in some ways we seek more influence, you know, what, what can we have more influence? How can we have a, make a bigger impact? Um, and I'm appreciating more than ever the value of public policy on health and how it affects communities, how it provides opportunities for people to be healthy. And also if people are healthy, the community is healthier. Mm -hmm. So I think it, the opportunity to, connect and promote activity in public ways, um, yeah, may have a bigger impact. I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> we all hope so, right? <laughs> right. Um, so you talked in there about becoming a high school athlete and then a college athlete um, during a time when it was, there were lots of firsts for women. And right. I'm wondering if you could talk about kind of some, some highlights from that time and then maybe some challenges as well. 
from that time period or now? From that time period. Yeah. yeah I, um, so again, it wasn't encouraged for girls to be athletic um, or yeah, I had a lot of pushback from my male, my boy peers. <laughs> um, that said, I was still often picked first, so they still appreciate it. <laughs> skill level, even though um, it was, yeah, sort of frowned upon to be um, athletic. I did um, another, cha- so yeah, that wasn't something that was celebrated very much. I was, felt a little different because I was athletic, Yeah. Um, but I remember I used to play tackle football. I'm not that big actually, <laughs> but I played tackle football with the boys and in eighth grade, um, my mom just thought this was inappropriate for a girl to be playing tackle football at my mm-hmm. age. Um, so she says, and I was not happy about that. So we, she said, okay, the doctor will get to decide, you know, if this is healthy for you or not. And mm-hmm. my mom asked her, what do you think of an eighth grade girl playing tackle football with boys? And he said, I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and of course that was pretty much, probably pretty much the end of my tackle football days at that point in my life too. <laughs> um, but that was, those were, you know, I had to always be seeking and like kind of persistent about mm-hmm. making like, yes, this is okay. This is good for me to do. This is healthy. This is who I want to be. So I felt a lot of push, although it's made me, you know, stronger mm-hmm. and uh, made, helped me persevere. Uh, those, I think, are, those were kind of the biggest challenges. I'm amazed today, you know, but I really love to look around today and how much things have been normalized and healthy and encouraged and promote it. Um, I sometimes will, well, this, I run around a park near our house and sometimes there's 10 girls soccer teams practicing at one time. And I remember stopping one time and just taking a deep breath and thinking, wow, you know, Mm -hmm. this is a different world for girls to have opportunities to be, to play and to be active and for parents to support it, you know, and Mm -hmm. boys and girls playing on the same team. Yeah. Um, So we've come a long way. And it's really amazing in the relatively short period of time, how far, how quickly how things have changed, right? Because those little girls playing, unless their moms or their grandmoms are talking about it, they don't, know that world, which is good. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. It's true. I also think it's impressive too, to see the um, quality of competition that girls have too. So not just playing, but I mean, really competitive um, opportunities that they, again, it's just really a a lot to celebrate. Um, Yeah. And we have so many great role models now than when I was younger. Um, Yeah. The Williams sisters, you know, Megan Mm -hmm. Rapinoe, Rapinoe, Mm -hmm. um, and then also the local champions that are role models like Susan Bradley Cox for so many of us. So yeah. we have role models everywhere now. They are. And I think that's a really good thing. And, and harnessing the power of those role models is, you know, part of this, this podcast, part of our initiative that we're really trying to take those, those role models and put them in a spotlight and um, give them, give them a platform. Yeah. Great. So those are the good things that you see now. Um, do you see inequities still and, and, kind of from your perspective, what should we be doing about them in sports or just women in activity in general? Yeah, I think this is an important question, um, of course. I think one of the biggest barriers I've, I still find is, and I'm a bit mystified, which I think your research is involved with, um, is how girls um, often stop being active um, early on. Um, and what is it that we can be doing to help encourage them through the lifespan, which is again, Mm -hmm. one of the important parts, I think of your initiatives that you are doing there at UK. Um, yeah, we, we lose a lot of girls, you know, for as many as Mm -hmm. are being active, which is so much to celebrate. Um, there's still a big opportunity um, that we need to be reaching more of them and supporting them along the way and finding out what will help motivate them to stay active. Um, so I think that's, that's really the, the biggest one that sort of jumps out at me is trying to understand that, that, um, that puzzle. Um, mm-hmm. Because there is, again, so much support um, f- once a woman becomes active. You know, right. to, so... So in, in thinking about and reading your bio, um, it seems to me that, that being active is just part of who you are to, to the core and has been for a long mm-hmm. time. Um, and I'm wondering if um, you, know, you could talk about what motivates you to be active and if that's changed over time. Hmm. 
Not sure it's changed over time, but okay. uh, it's definitely part. Uh, yeah, it's definitely in the, my core being for sure. Um, what motivates me is I, I am like most athletes. I actually love the feeling of being strong and fit and healthy. Um, so that definitely motivates me. Um, I love to play. Um, I I like adventure. Um, I like solving problems. Um, and I love challenges. So I think, I think mm-hmm. athletics help instill that sort of love of finding a challenge to push ourselves to, you know, be a little bit more, be a little stronger, be a little more skilled. Um, and I still really am motivated to be active with friends. Okay. So it is social definitely for you, part of social it. Social mm-hmm. for me. I mean, uh, uh, we did do run club at West Six. Then mm-hmm. our friends, you know, decided to do half marathon and train together. Yeah. Um, so I think that's still really important to me is the sort of teamwork. Even though I still do a lot of individual sports, I still like doing them with others. Mm-hmm. I really value the friendships that sports give. It helps women and inc- you know create and develop. I've heard that a lot with uh, almost all the women who I've interviewed for this podcast. They're, they're finding this community in sport with other women a lot of times, and it's a really cool thing. Right. I agree. So um, it, you, you talked about liking a challenge. Um, so what's your, your next goal or your next challenge? What are you working towards right now or enjoying right now? Yeah, so um, since I moved to Kentucky, um, I've become really involved with the Bluegrass Cycling Club and um, love to cycle. We have obviously one of the most beautiful places in the world, I have to say, Mm -hmm. um, for (laughs) riding. Um, So every summer I have a cycling challenge, and this summer, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, (laughs) (laughs) um, I'm planning to go with a group of friends up to Vermont to do the the Vermont Challenge. Um, It's a five-day bike trip, which includes involves a couple century rides um, and it's going to be hilly. So it will be a challenge. So yeah. that will be my summer workout goal. Yeah. So what, what does, um, when you're not actively engaging in one of those challenges, what, what does a, a week or a month of activity oh. look like for you? Oh, nice. Um, so I'm, I run, um, I run and I cycle. So um, in the winter, I actually cross country ski too. That's one of my oh, biggest nice passions and loves actually. <laughs> so I have to I always say I have to buy my snow because I live in Kentucky. <laughs> <We don't laughs> That's true. It. We didn't get much this year either. I know. Um, so in the, in the winter, I do tend to, to run more. And then as the weather changes, then I t- become more of a cyclist. Um, so yeah, my goal is actually to exercise every day. Um, and when I don't, then it's okay you know, like it's normal to have a day off or two. So when I get too busy with work or something, um, it's okay to, you know, but my plan is then I go the next day. Um, I love being outside. That's another thing about um, being active for me. I love the whole, whole nature and being outside in the sun. So you have found a way to make activity part of your life and to stick with it. Um, a lot of people have tried activity. Mm. Almost all people can say, I know activity is good for me. Or I know exercise is good for me, but um, then have trouble maintaining. Um, what, what do you think are the, the biggest challenge with maintaining an active lifestyle and um, how can we help people to be more active over the long term? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think finding something that a person likes to do is important. You know, so many times people say, well, I don't like running. I'm like, you shouldn't run. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's important to find an activity. And it, there's so many different kinds of activities to do. Um, so I think that's one. Um, so taking risks um, to try new things that you may not know if you like or not because you haven't had the opportunity to try it before. So I, it's important to find something that we like. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm social, finding people to do it with. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we have a model in our culture too that um, to be physically fit, you have to be a world-class marathoner. You know, like you have mm-hmm. to be like the best of the best to be physically active. Um, but I think think moving is just important. Um, and I, I, I think if we can just encourage people to enjoy each other, be outside mm-hmm. um, and keep moving. Yeah. I have a mantra is move, move more. Most, mostly, mostly with often, out, no, sorry, hold on. Move more, mostly with others, often outside. Um, oh, I love that. 
<laughs> yeah. So it's, it's my play on Michael Pollan's. I was going to say, it sounds <laughs> like uh, indefensive food. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to write this article about it in someday um, using my active model. Yeah. I love that. Uh, yeah. I think it's, but for me, I just really, it, sometimes I, I do struggle um, in finding the right way to uh, explain why I do what I do because it's so much part of who I am. I can't imagine mm-hmm. not being physically active. Yeah, you probably have a really hard time dis- disentangling, disentangling it from who you are, right? right it's just right. one and the same. Right. So um, I just switch gears a little bit and, and I'd like you to talk about, um, as, as we think about population health and getting people to maintain activity, um, I think your advocacy work is really interesting and important. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about the Bike Walk Summit that you hosted last year and any of the outcomes that have come from that and um, you know, what we should be looking for next. Yeah, great. I love that. Um, so yeah, and we had a statewide um, bike walk summit in Lexington. We was hosted at Transylvania. We had over 300 people participate. Um, we actually had the um, head of the Department of Transportation come and speak. Um, we had Mayor Jim Gray at the time welcome everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, so we we're um, the goal was to bring in all these different speakers and advocates um, and experts to talk about cycling um, from a, a number of different v- venues, transportation, uh, health, um, tourism, which is important for the state. Um, actually, Oregon, um, cycling actually brings in more money than lumber uh Oh my timber. gosh. <laughs> yes. I mean, so some states have made a major cultural shift into using to having cycling as a uh, revenue stream, right, for their um, for the state. And Kentucky is so beautiful for cycling. Um, so we had four national speakers, one that came and spoke from each of the areas. Um, so we had a great dialogue for two days at Transy. Um, so we're super excited about that. And the outcome that we've... Um, can officially say has succeeded as of this year. Um, We have for the first time a state um, bike walk advocacy group. So it's called Bike Walk Kentucky. Um, We have a board, our first board meeting was in January. So again, we're gonna look to work for advocacy, tourism, um, education, promotion of physical activity for Mm -hmm. a healthier state. I love it. And what a big mission. And um, (laughs) you'll be busy for as long as you can see into the future, I'm sure. Right, right. Um, Lots of work to do. And I'm looking forward to seeing things that come out of that. And, um, you know, if there's any way we can help, certainly let us us know. So um, I'm not sure you can answer this question, given what you've said before, but how do you think your life would be different if you didn't have those early opportunities as a young girl in sport and physical activity? Yeah. Wow. That is a hard one to imagine. (laughs) Um, It is a hard one to imagine. Um, How would my life be different? I, I wonder if I would have less confidence um, in, in perseverance skills that I really value from my days of being um, athletic. Well, I'm still hopefully athletic. Um, So I think that would be something that would be hard. I still, when I I love to hike and when I'm with friends and I get to walk into places four or five miles into this spectacular place, I think sometimes not everyone has a chance to get here if they're not healthy or if they're not, yeah, fit enough to come and explore the world. So yeah, I think I would, the world might be a little less beautiful if I Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, didn't have the opportunity and confidence to um, be healthy and stay healthy. So what advice would you give girls and women who are try, or trying to play sports or want to play sports or just about being active and, and playing sports in general? Yeah, I, my first, is, my first uh, advice is sign up. <laughs> sign up. Sign up to play. I think that's important. Um, I think it's important to set goals, right, and um, to work hard at them. I still value that skill that I was – pushed into and encouraged, um, by being athletic, uh, enjoy friendships, find, you know, find friends on the team, um, find friends that you run alongside with. I think those are, um, as you said, everyone's talking about friendships when we talk about women being active. Yeah. Have fun. And, 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 and as your program is trying to do, uh, share that joy of being active, uh, with other girls and women and 
let's spread it. Mm-hmm. Build that community for sure. Yeah. So what else would you like to share about your story as a, as a girl and now a woman um, being active? I guess I maybe the I just feel really grateful for people who have fought ahead of my time um, to give uh, me the opportunity. And I do think it's an important story that we tell young women today that there was a time where women couldn't be active. So I think this whole idea of um, feeling appreciative for the opportunities we have and to continue to push for more, Mm -hmm. um, there's always more work to do. Um, I think that's an important part of celebrating women um, and girls being active is understanding our history and, and also looking for ways to go forward. Great. Well, I appreciate you sharing your time with us today. And um, I thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Champions of Active Women podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the Active Women's Health Initiative and was produced by the Faculty Media Depot at the University of Kentucky. If you enjoyed this episode, you can listen and subscribe to all of our episodes wherever you find your podcasts. For up-to-date information about the Active Women's Health Initiative, you can find us on social media at UKAWHI. Thank you for supporting us as we work to promote health and physical activity among girls and women across the lifespan.